and my colleague, uh, Dr. Gary Sinclair. Uh, so Gary uh, is uh, one of uh, an extremely rare, uh, rarely met uh, nowadays, a kind uh, of uh, universal physicist. Uh, he is, uh, so he holds uh, a PhD in theoretical physics uh, from the University of uh, St. Andrews. Uh, yet uh, during most of his career, uh, he was uh, actually working uh, in, uh, in the field of experimental and applied uh, photonics. Uh, notably as the senior uh, research associate uh, at uh, the University of Bristol. Uh, before uh, joining the University of Wolverhampton uh, as a senior lecturer in photonics. Uh, so not only that, not only that, he also managed to uh, somehow combine his research uh, with actual work uh, in the industry uh, as an uh, engineer in photonics uh, and uh, a consultant a technologist. So he is a true, uh, he's truly an expert in photonics. Uh, he knows it uh, inside out and uh, he will, he's going to uh, share uh, some of uh, this knowledge with us today, hopefully, uh, to which I'm personally uh, looking forward. Uh, so one, one last comment. Uh, please uh, type your uh, tricky and provocative questions uh, in uh, pressing the Q&A or chat uh, button uh, button at the uh, bottom of the of the window. And uh, so, please, uh, uh, Gary, the virtual stage is uh, all yours. If you can, if you could share your screen. Thanks very much, Anton. Thanks for the introduction. I'll just share my slides. Hopefully you can all see that now and hear me okay. Excellent. Okay, so today um, I'm going to talk about computing with light. Now, um, I'm going to start off with this one slide history of computing. Now, computing devices have taken on many different forms over the years. And they started off with, um, you know, simple devices like this abacus up in the top right hand side, which were purely mechanical, obviously, uh, but enabled a great deal of calculations to be done. Now, uh, abacuses have existed since, uh, you know, ancient times uh, and have continued to be used up until the recent day. Uh, around about the 1890s, uh, computing, mechanical computing devices developed quite a bit with the introduction of things like this pinwheel calculator down on the left hand side. Uh, developed by Oldner in the 1890s in Russia. I think he was a Swedish man himself, but he was working in Russia at the time. And these pinwheel calculators carried on in use uh, up until the 1960s, basically, when uh, in the post-war period, methods of computing electronically became cost-effective and available. And so by the time 1961 arrives, uh, computers or calculators at least this is a, a device, the Sumlock electronic calculator on the bottom right hand side from 1961. These have been sold on the scale of tens of thousands. So they were no longer just things in research institutes, but they're actually available for people to buy in companies around the UK. So um, that's kind of very short history of computation. Now, when we think of computing nowadays, of course, we tend to think of electronic computers rather than the mechanical stuff that came before them. So um, looking at the history of electronic computing really starts um, in the post-war period. And because I'm based in the University of Wolverhampton, I'm gonna talk about, of course, a machine from Wolverhampton. It's the uh, Wolverhampton Instrument for Teaching Computing from Harwell, which, now this machine was actually built in Harwell in 1951 for doing nuclear physics calculations. But then by about 1957, it moved over to the University of Wolverhampton, which was then the Wolverhampton and Staffordshire Technical College, and it was used for teaching computing at the time. Now, um, this computer actually is quite large and electronic, but it wasn't particularly fast. In fact, a skilled operator using the mechanical calculator I showed you in the previous slide could do calculations just as quick as this machine. The difference about this machine was it could run 24 hours a day uninterrupted. That was, that was why it was built, and that was its advantage. Now this machine actually is still existing. It's actually the world's oldest um, electronic stored program computer and it's at the National Computing of Museum. 
in uh, Bletchley Park. So if you want to go and see it, you can go and see it there. And this image actually is, uh, I'll just mention it briefly. Uh, this image is a, one of a series of photographs taken of old vintage computers by a photographer who was trying to take these photographs in the style of an iPhone advert, which is why it's very uh, bright colours and fresh looking. So it's a uh, artwork inspired by uh, this old computer from Wolverhampton, which spent most of its life in Wolverhampton. Now, like I say, this computer wasn't particularly fast and computers nowadays are obviously a lot faster than this one. Um, what's driven that change in speed? So what we see is that uh, over the decades, um, the, what's driven the increase in performance of computers are the ever greater number of transistors that we can fit on a chip. Now that wasn't actually a transistor computer, that was a decatron based computer, a type of thermionic valve. But over the, since 1970s, computers have basically been based on solid state devices like the transistor. And we can see here in this graph, the horizontal axis is the year, and the vertical axis is the transistor count on a logarithmic scale. And what this straight line is showing is that basically you've got an exponential growth in the number of transistors on a chip that we, that we have uh, access to nowadays. And this has led to computers becoming both faster, more energy efficient, and a lot more complex over the last few decades. So from the 1970s to basically the present day, this growth and complexity and speed has remained almost uninterrupted. If you look at this graph a little more closely though, and you look around about the year 2008, you can maybe start to see a slight tailing off of that growth. And the concern of people at the moment is that perhaps we're reaching a point where we can't shrink transistors down anymore. Uh, transistors are already at the 10 nanometer scale. So the feature size of these transistors is about 10 nanometers. There's a physical limit to how small we can actually make these things because we're reaching actually a fairly small number of atoms per transistor. So the question is how long can this trend continue and what do we do when we can no longer continue the same process that we've done before to extend Moore's law um, in the future. So one of the proposed solutions to this is to compute using a different technique, just like we had, we started off with mechanical computers and went on to electronic, perhaps it's time for another shift where we move from electronic to other means of calculation. And some people think that other means should be optical computing. So that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. But before I do, I'm going to talk a little bit about transistors, what their limitations are, and how we believe that optical computing is going to overcome those uh, limitations. So just as a reminder, this is a bipolar junction transistor. That's a thing you see in your undergraduate physics course or in school. So um, it's transistors of, well, it's actually field effect transistors they use in computers, but transistors of a similar type, uh, which are used in computing devices. Now this transistor we have here, this uh, bipolar junction transistor, is um, has a three terminal device. Now the three terminals are, I just realized my computer's running out of charge, I definitely need a more efficient machine than this. Now the three terminals we have are the base, the collector and the emitter. And the, um, just gonna plug this thing in. So the way this device works is that we um, control the collector and emitter current by injecting a current between the base and the emitter. Okay, so we have, we have a switch where we can control the collector emitter current by the uh, base emitter current. So this device has a current amplification and that lets us um, use this as a controllable switch. Now physically, what does this device look like? Well, on the right hand side here, I have uh, a diagram of the device and it involves three different uh, doped regions of silicon. We have an N-doped region, a P-doped region in the middle and an N-doped region at the bottom. Now, when we inject a current into the base between the base and the emitter, that reduces the depletion region formed between the P and the N regions. And by reducing the width of the depletion region, it allows minority carriers to come from the N region through the depletion region from the collector down to the emitter. So um, that's how the device works. For the purposes of this talk, 
what we're really interested in is if we look at this base and emitter junction, what we see is we have a metal contact on the left-hand side of the base. We have a metal contact on the bottom for the emitter. Now, when we have these two metal contacts with a space in between, that looks like a capacitor. So this transistor, uh, from the perspective of a signal being injected in the base, is going to look somewhat capacitive. Okay. So what I've drawn here is basically there's going to be some base emitter capacitance in this device. And it's that capacitance which is going to play quite a large role in determining the performance of our transistor when we're trying to use it as a controllable switch. So let's have a look at that. So there's three things I'm going to talk about. The first one is the switching speed. The second one is the energy consumption. And the third factor I'm going to talk about is noise in the circuit. So let's look at switching speed to begin with. So optical and electrical pulses actually travel at roughly the same speed. Um, for example, if you have an optical signal going down an optical fiber, it travels uh, roughly a little bit low the, below the speed of light. And similarly, an electrical pulse traveling along an electrical transmission line will travel at a very high speed too. What's actually limiting the speed of, a, of the switches, the transistors in a computer chip is the capacitance of those transistors. So this base emitter capacitance. So for example, I've drawn a circuit on the left-hand side here where I have a resistor and a capacitor connected up in series with the power supply and a switch. So when I have the capacitor initially discharged, there'll be no voltage across it, which is what I'm plotting on the vertical axis of this right-hand graph. However, when I close the switch, a current will flow around the circuit through the resistor into the capacitor and it will build up on the capacitor plates. And so what we see is a gradual build up of the voltage across this capacitor. Now the characteristic time it takes for this capacitor to charge is given by this time constant, tau, which is the product of the resistance and the capacitance. So we can see that the larger the capacitance, the larger the time constant and the slower that this, the, the longer it'll take for the voltage across this junction to reach the turn on voltage for the switch. Okay. Obviously, um, larger transistors have larger capacitances and are slower. So this shrinking down of the transistors has allowed us to reduce that capacitance and hence speed up at the rate, which we can, when we apply voltage to the space emitter uh, junction, that we can actually get it to turn on. However, like I was saying, that's going to be limited by how small we can make these um, transistors. On the other hand, optics allows computing at the speed of light. That's what people often say. Why is that? Well, because we don't have any active devices like transistors in an optical circuit. The optical circuit is passive and the light can travel through that at just below the speed of light or the speed of light in that particular material. The fact that the circuit doesn't have any active nonlinear devices also limits the type of problem you can solve, but at least for those types of problem, it's going to happen at the maximum speed possible that the, the pulses can propagate through there, unlike uh, for transistors or electronic circuits. So the second thing I want to talk about is the energy consumption. This is another big factor. Um, of course, data centers are using ever more amounts of energy and a large amount of cost of running them is just the energy consumption. So what limits the energy consumption for a, a electronic transistorized switch? Well, again, let's consider the transistor as just a capacitor in this situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that my capacitor is initially discharged and it's connected down to the zero volt uh, terminal at the bottom here. Okay. But then I flick the switch up so that the capacitor is going to charge due to it being connected to this voltage source on the left hand side. Now, we know that when a capacitor charges up, the charge which builds up in the capacitor is just given by the product of the capacitance and the voltage. So Q, the charge in the capacitor, is just the capacitance times the voltage applied to it. Now, I know from Kirchhoff's laws that that current has to flow around the circuit. So that current must have flowed through the voltage source as well. However, I know that when I move a charge through um, a voltage source between a point of say zero volts and V volts, the energy supplied by that voltage source is just the, uh, the charge, the amount of charge times the potential difference. So the energy supplied by the source is the amount of charge Q 
times by the voltage through which we move it to the voltage source. And of course, we knew that Q was CV, so the energy supplied by the source is CV squared. However, we also know that the amount of energy stored in a capacitor, we get this in our undergraduate physics course, is a half CV squared. Okay, so I know that my source has supplied CV squared of energy, but only half of that, a half CV squared, has been stored in the capacitor. The rest of that energy must have gone somewhere, and of course that's been dissipated in the resistor. So the energy dissipated or lost by the resistor as heat must be the difference between the energy supplied by the source and the energy stored in the capacitor, which is a CV squared minus a half CV squared, which again gives us a half CV squared. Now, the reason I put this calculation in here is because the result is actually very strange when you think about it. I've got an energy loss for half CV squared, but at no point in this calculation have I actually mentioned the value of the resistor. So in actual fact, we can see that no matter how small we make the value of the resistor, the energy loss is always going to be the same. So we can't remove this loss just by making our circuits out of more conducting materials. The energy loss is intrinsic to the way we're charging this capacitor up by connecting it to a voltage source in this way. So we can't really avoid this energy loss when we have a circuit of this nature, even if we remove all the resistances. And that's kind of unusual. On the other hand, uh, when we think about uh, doing, uh, producing circuits optically, an optical circuit can at least theoretically be lossless. And indeed, if you look at an optical fiber, you can send uh, optical pulses through hundreds of kilometers of, or say 100 kilometers of optical fiber without any amplification at all. So optical circuits can at least theoretically be extremely low loss, unlike what we have when we're switching a capacitor on a uh, transistor on and off. The final thing I want to talk about in terms of the limitations and motivations for using optical computing is thermal noise. Now here I have a slightly different circuit. This time I have a current source and it's driving a current around my little circuit consisting of just the current source and the resistor. Now I'm applying a square wave current to the circuit. I know from Ohm's law, V equals IR, that the voltage measured across the resistor should just be the product of the square wave current times the resistance. So I ought to see just a square wave voltage appearing as well across the resistor. And that's almost what I get if I actually measure this. I get my square wave voltage, yes, but superimposed on that is some noise. And this is called the thermal Johnson noise. And it occurs in any resistor at room temperature. And it's an example of actually fluctuation dissipation theorem, for those of you who are interested in that. But um, the formula for the root mean squared noise on the signal is given below. Now the important thing I want you to take away from this formula is that it's proportional to the square root of the bandwidth of the frequencies over which we're sampling. Now if we've got an electrical circuit and we want it to operate quickly, we need it to convey a large number of frequencies, a very wide bandwidth of frequencies. However, as we increase the bandwidth of that circuit, the root mean squared noise that's superimposed on the signal we're wanting also increases. Okay, so greater bandwidths of faster switching speeds in my electrical circuit will necessitate greater noise too. And of course, if we're going to keep a good signal to noise ratio of my pulse that I'm trying to transmit over the noise, then it, that limits how low I can reduce my voltage. Now, one of the problems with that is if you look at our previous slide, actual fact the energy dissipated varied as the squared of the voltage. So we really didn't want to have to use high voltages. There's also practical considerations about what's the turn on voltages for the gates themselves. But aside from that, even if we could get different materials, there's going to be this noise source term too, which we need to ensure we have a good signal to noise ratio. So it limits how low we can reduce our voltage when doing electronic computing fundamentally. Now let's look at the optical version of this. Now, optically, light is made up of photons, and at room temperature, there are very few thermal photons, at least at the frequencies we normally use for optical computing. So um, there's actually very little thermal contribution to the noise. Instead, what we have is for an optical pulse, which is made up of photons, for a classical pulse, we don't ever know exactly how many photons are in that pulse. So there's always an uncertainty associated with the number of photons in a pulse. 
So if n is the average photon number, and delta n is the uncertainty in the number of photons, so the standard deviation of the number of photons we measure when we actually take a measurement, we can define the relative uncertainty as just the variation in the photon number over the average photon number. And we find for a classical pulse of light, so the kind of light we use in our classical um, in our optical computers, we find that the variation in that noise varies as one over the square root of n. Okay, where remember n is the average photon number. So larger numbers of photon in the pulse result in smaller relative uncertainties in the amplitude of that pulse. So as an example, consider a pulse with 10,000 photons. So for a pulse with 10,000 photons, the relative uncertainty is just one over the square root of 10,000. That's one over 100, so it's 1%. So with only 10,000 photons, we have a, a relative uncertainty of 1%, which is really good. The question is, how much energy does it take to produce a pulse of 10,000 photons? Well, if I choose a useful wavelength of about 1.5 micron, a lot of the stuff we do is at this wavelength 1.5 micron. It's called the telecom band, and it's um, very easy to get lasers which work at that. And there's other practical reasons for it. So if we use one of these 1.5 micron photons, we find that the energy of a pulse with 10,000 photons in it is only 8 electron volts. So what does 8 electron volts mean? So remember, an electron volt or 8 electron volts is equivalent to the energy required to move eight electrons through a potential difference of one volt. So when you think back to what we were trying to do before, we're trying to turn uh, capacitive transistors on and off, that required huge numbers of electrons, and a large amount of current to do that. Here what we have is we have a pulse with an incredibly small uncertainty of only 1%, and the energy we've used to create that pulse is only equivalent to eight single electrons moved through a potential of one volt. So that kind of puts it in context about um, how low the energy is we need to create uh, pulses with an excellent signal to noise ratio. So that's a real big motivation for computing the light as well. So just to summarize, what's our motivations? Well, we've seen that optics can be potentially faster. We don't have any active devices that are capacitive to turn on and off. So we can do at least passive transformation, so um, linear calculations extremely quickly, and they can also be extremely energy efficient because we can create these little pulses of light with very small uh, uncertainties in them with a very small amount of energy compared to what we use electronically. The question is, um, how are we going to do a simulation? How are we going to use this to compute? Okay, so we've seen some of the motivations here initially comparing electronics to optics. But what kind of a calculation are we going to do with this? So let's look at um, analog simulations to begin with. Okay, so what is a simulation? Well, a simulator can be a scale model of a system which shares the same underlying physics, or it can be a completely diff different physical system. So for example, on the left here, this is clearly an analog simulator. So it's an analog simulation of an aircraft. And this is a wind tunnel, possibly in Toulouse or Bristol Filton, I'm not quite sure which wind tunnel it is that Airbus has. And what they've done is they've taken an uh, aircraft that they want to test, they've scaled it down, and they've put it in a wind tunnel. So clearly, the physics of the system they're interested in, the large aircraft, is exactly the same physics as the small aircraft which they have in the wind tunnel. You have to be a little careful to make sure things like the Reynolds numbers are matched and stuff like that, but the physics, underlying physics, is exactly the same. And the analogy is very clear in that. On the right hand side, we have an electronic analog simulation. So this is a um, Telefunken uh, analog computer from the 1960s, 1970s. And what they're doing is they're doing a electrical simulation of the mechanical system. And the mechanical system they're looking at is the suspension of a car. So what they've done is they've translated the mathematics and the physics of the mechanical car suspension into an electrical analog system composed of operational amplifiers and differentiators um, in this electronic analog computer. Okay, so the question is, can I do something similar? Can I take a mechanical problem, for example, and solve it instead of in an electrical analog system? Can I do it in an optical analog system? 
So let's have a look at that and see if we can do it. So um, the, the problem we're going to consider is that of projectile motion. So here I have a cannon and it's firing off a cannonball um, at some muzzle velocity v and it's firing off an angle phi to the horizontal. Now, um, obviously gravity is going to act upon this cannonball, so there's going to be a downwards acceleration due to gravity. Now we can fairly easily calculate the trajectory of this. It's a parabolic trajectory and uh, we can work out the maximum height to which that cannonball will travel. And it's given by this formula here. Now you can calculate that result using say the kinematic equations, uh, for example, v squared equals u squared plus 2as. If you just do a simple rearrangement of that formula, you get this result. Or you can use Newton's laws of motion or energy conservation, whatever it is you want to calculate this result. But this is the height of the cannonball, maximum height of the cannonball, as a function of the angle, the velocity which is fired, and the gravitational acceleration. Now um, let's just pop some numbers in. So let's say we have a muzzle velocity of 10 meters per second, and an angle of 45 degrees, and a gravitational acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Well, I can plug those numbers in and I can find that the cannonball will reach a maximum height of 2.5 meters at a range of five meters. So once it's traveled five meters horizontally, it'll be 2.5 meters up. So remember those numbers, because we're gonna go back and see if we can get this in an optical system later. So the question is then, okay, so I, I want an optical analog system. So probably what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and create a system where I have a laser, a light ray, for example, and I want that light ray to traverse exactly the same trajectory as the cannonball has done. So what kind of an optical system? How can I make my light ray travel along the same trajectory as the cannonball? So, Light rays normally travel in a straight line, but we can modify their paths. And we do that using the effect of refraction, of course. So we're all familiar with refraction, as this gentleman in the water tank is demonstrating. So um, you can see that the real position of this physicist in the water tank, we can see that above the water level. You know, he's standing there holding up this physics fun sign. But his body appears to be moved to the right. And that's happening due to the fraction of the light rays when they leave the tank of water. So here I have a um, diagram looking straight down um, on this water tank. And we can see that the object's real position, where the man's head and arm are, is here. The light ray travels to the side of the water tank and is then refracted. So the light ray is bent as it leaves the interface between the water and the air outside. And that creates this optical illusion where it appears, the virtual image of the man appears to the right hand side of where he actually is, because we, our eye assumes the light rays are traveling along straight lines. And so it appears that the man is um, not quite where his real position is. So how do we describe um, the physics of this mathematically? Well, we use Snell's law of refraction. So um, Snell's law relates the angle at which uh, a ray is re refracted or bent for a particular incoming angle when it travels from one material to another. So for example, here I have some D-shaped lens. Uh, the lens is made out of glass and the surrounding air is, um, is just air. So we can work out the angle um, which these two rays make to the normal, so this horizontal line. Uh, and we find that it's related to the refractive index of the materials. Now the refractive index is just this proportionality constant between the velocity of the light in the material and the velocity of light in a vacuum. So the velocity of light in a vacuum is three times 10 to eight meters per second. But um, if it's going through a material with a refractive index of two, it's gonna be half of that. And so we take the speed of light in the vacuum, divide it by N, the refractive index, and that gives us the speed of the, material, the light in that material. So this gives us a means of calculating the angle at which light is bent. So that suggests, well, maybe we can arrange layers of the material so that the path of the light ray is identical to the projectile. So how are we gonna do that? So here's my simulation of an analog simulation using light. And what I've done is I've taken a laser pointer and this laser pointer is shining a ray through this 
uh, layered material. So we can see the at the top of this um, graph, we have the lower refractive index and the bottom we have the higher refractive index, which is indicated by the shade of blue. Now, the refractive index distribution I've chosen is given by this function at the bottom, and I'll, I'll come back in a minute to where I get that function from. But if I uh, model the ray, the optical ray, traveling through that distribution, I find that it travels exactly the same path as the, the projectile did. So it reaches a maximum of 2.5 meters at a range of five meters. Okay, so here what I've done is I've managed to take a mechanical system and map that onto an optical problem, which I can um, basically get my laser pointer and shine my light through this completely passive material system, this stacked layers of dielectric material, and I can work out what the tra trajectory of my projectile is going to be. The question is, of course, how on earth do I work out what the correct refractive index distribution is. So um, this is a little bit uh, complicated mathematically, but um, the reason we can do that is because the basics behind it is that both Hamiltonian mechanics, so the mechanics of the cannonball, and ray optics can both be derived from variational principles. Now some of you, if you've done some fairly advanced optics, will have seen Fermat's principle before. So what it's saying is if I'm moving between a point A and a point B, that the optical path length, so the length multiplied by the refractive index, um, if I integrate that along the actual path of my light ray, if I vary the path slightly, so I take slightly different trajectories, then this integral is to first order a constant. So it's um, small variations in the path around the actual path it don't result in any change in this integral. So that's what my variation principle says. Now, similarly, we can do a similar thing for mechanics. Hamilton's principle is called mechanics. So this is actually Jacobi's form of the principle of stationary action, a slightly different form to what you normally see, but it more closely corresponds to Fermat's principle. Here, what I'm saying is if I move a mechanical system, so my cannonball from A to B, if I integrate the energy minus the potential energy and take the square root of that over the path, and then I do a variation along neighboring paths, I also find that there's no change of that integral um, for, uh, for neighboring paths. But what we can see is that um, how I managed to choose my correct refractive index distribution is I just looked at these two quantities, the thing under the square root and this function n, which is the refractive index, and I equated them to each other to work out what my correct refractive index should be. So this term here, the v squared, has come from the uh, the energy of the cannonball when it was fired from the cannon. It was all kinetic energy. And this term here, the g times the y, is basically the gravitational potential energy of the cannonball as it travels through space. Okay, so that's how I chose it. Don't worry about the maths too much. There is a means to work out the um, correct distributions, basically. So um, do we use this? Well, Unlike in electronics, uh, analog simulations uh, in optics haven't been extensively used. The reason for that is it's just really difficult to construct these refractive index distributions. I did a simulation of it there. I, I did a rotor ray tracing program and worked out what the optical ray should be. In practice, it's a very difficult thing to do to find all the materials necessary um, to create this range, uh, this trajectory of the light ray and it's difficult to assemble them all and find um, and then you have to do it every time you change the problem. So it's not a very practical way of solving problems. The other issue is that um, the simulations are linear only, so optics is linear generally. Most of the, and in actual fact we find that throughout all optical computation at the moment, all of the techniques people are using are for solving linear problems only. So um, unlike in electronics, where that Telefunken analog computer was very popular and widely used in industry and in universities. Optical analog simulations of the type I've been describing aren't used in that way. So what can we do? So let's look at a different problem instead. Let's say we want to multiply two numbers together. So multiplication of two numbers is incredibly useful for many things. For example, I might want to do some financial calculations and I want to know what my shopping bill is and this week I've not bought much, I've only bought five apples at 30 pence each and four oranges at 35 pence each. 
but I can multiply my numbers together and then add them up at the end to work out what my total shopping bill is. That's an obvious use of multiplication, but we can also generalize it to things like matrix multiplication, where, for example, if X and Y are the price of apples and oranges, then A might be the number of apples that I've bought, B is the number of oranges I've bought, and C might be the number of apples that Anton has bought, and D is the number of oranges which Anton has bought. So we can do this calculation, we can use this matrix on the vector to calculate the total cost of my shopping bill at the top, AX plus BY, and the total cost of Anton's shopping bill at the bottom, CX plus DY. Now, of course, we can generalize it to many more problems than this. Uh, a huge number of problems in, say, uh, you know, image manipulation, uh, data science, uh, structural mechanics, heat flows, all of these things, the analysis of many electrical circuits can be done using this matrix analysis as well. So I've used a trivial example here, but it's extremely applicable to many other types of calculation which people are very interested in. So how do we multiply two numbers together optically? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to represent those numbers as an optical analog signal. So generally speaking, the data I have is going to be stored digitally in my computer as a series of ones and zeros. So for example, a number 11 is stored as this series of um, high and low logic levels in my computer, and the number three is stored as a different set of high and low logic levels in my computer. What well, the first thing I need to do is convert those digital um, representation of the numbers into an analog representation. So I have some digital to analog converter which changes my number A stored digitally into a pulse with say 11 units of height. And for the number B, I create another pulse with say three units of height. So those represent the two numbers that I wanted to multiply. So how do I actually multiply them? Well, what I do is I feed them into a thing called a homodyne detector. Okay, so I'll just talk briefly in words through how this works. So I have my two optical pulses and these travel along and they interfere or they mix on a beam splitter. That's the first thing to do. So if these two numbers are going to multiply with each other, they need to be um, interrupted in some ways. So this beam splitter basically allows half of the light to travel through and half of it gets reflected off. And it does that for both of the optical pulses. So um, these things, these gray objects, D plus and D minus are two optical detectors. So what we have at the detector D plus and what we have at the detector D minus is basically the sum of EA and EB. Okay, so th they've mixed on the beam splitter and they've um, come over here to the detectors where they're detected. Now, the critical thing about this is the detectors don't detect the amplitude of these electric fields, the, of the electric fields themselves. They detect the intensity, which is proportional to the square of the amplitude. And this nonlinearity in the detectors is essential to get the multiplication. If we had the sum of just the field, if we only detected some of the fields here, we wouldn't get any multiplication. But when we have um, detecting something proportional to the square of them, then we have an A plus B squared term, which will have some products between A and B in it. Okay, so we have EA plus EB, and we square that whole thing, there'll be some crossed terms in there as well, where products of EA and EB appear. So we take these two photodiode signals, and what we need to do is get rid of all the terms we're not interested in and just keep those product terms. And we do that by feeding both of the photodiode signals into a different scene amplifier. And we find that the output that comes out of this, the electrical output that comes out of this amplifier is proportional to the product of EA and EB, which is exactly what we were wanting. Okay, so we've managed to take our two optical pulses and multiply them and produce an electrical signal at the end, which is proportional to that product we were looking for. So that's how we do it for two numbers, but we can scale this up to the matrix multiplications that I was talking about earlier that was so useful for many domains in physics and mathematics and computer science. So this has been done, for example, in this paper from 2019, and it's using exactly the same technique as I showed in the previous slide. So here, um, the X values come in on the left-hand side are the numbers in the vector, and the 
from the bottom here, we have a series of optical pulses coming in, each of these different lines, and those represent each of the columns or each of the rows of the matrix that I'm wanting to multiply them by. So what we have here is that each number from the uh, column vector comes along here and it mixes with the corresponding number from the row of the matrix on this beam splitter. So this is what the beam splitter here represents. This is what the uh, diagonal line represents as a beam splitter. Um, so they, or a, a dichroic mirror probably actually. So they mix on this mirror and come along here to a homodyne detector, just like we had in the previous slide, where the two, the two signals mix. So the um, optically encoded uh, column vector and the optically encoded rows of the matrix. And they multiply using the beam splitter and the photo detectors just as we had uh, in the previous slide. Okay, but here, instead of doing it with just two numbers, they've done it to whole matrices of numbers, but the technique's exactly the same. Now, they proposed this in this paper uh, by Dirk England's group in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They proposed it for doing neural networks, so optical neural networks. So after this homodyne detector, they also have an integrator and a nonlinear function, which then feeds onto the next layer of the neural network. So, um, but the techniques is exactly the same as what I said before. It's basically just multiplying these two numbers optically. Now there's alternative ways to multiply numbers as well. One of the techniques is instead of um, taking the, encoding both the matrix values and the vector values optically, you can encode the, the vector values optically. So this here, EA is my optical pulse I want to multiply, but instead of interfering it with another pulse of light, Alternatively, you control the output by setting a phase shift with an interferometer. So this thing here is a max center interferometer, okay? So what I find is that when I, what this interferometer does, it takes a pulse of light and it splits at the initial beam splitter into two different paths and recombines again at the output beam splitter. Now, there's a path difference. So a difference in the optical path introduced in both of these arms by this thing called a phase shifter. And depending on the value that this phase shifter applies, the difference in the optical path, we can direct more or less light to each of these output ports. So in that way, if I just monitor the output on say this port here, the one uh, horizontally, by varying the value of um, phi b, the phase shift, I can basically multiply this um, pulse Ea by any value between zero and one. So I'm also doing a multiplication of sorts, but only one of the numbers is represented optically, and the other one is represented by a number I'm dialing up on this phase shifter. Okay, so I can basically uh, either put all the light out of here, in which case I'm multiplying it by the value one, or I can have none of the light coming out the horizontal port, all of it's going directly downwards, in which case, from the perspective of the horizontal port, um, I've multiplied it by zero, or I can do anything in between. Now, with a few more phase shifters um, in the circuit we, and a second pulse of light, in actual fact, I can do um, a matrix multiplication just using this simple circuit. So I can do any special unitary two matrix in actual fact. So the mathematicians will recognize what that means. But it's a particular class of matrix which people are interested in. Now, um, so even with this simple circuit, I can do some fairly simple matrix multiplications. But again, I can scale this whole thing up once again. I can scale up to much larger optical networks. And this is from a paper from 2017, I believe, um, which uh, is actually, this is the technique used by uh, a lot of companies doing this sort of stuff at the moment. So again, they have the vector of values come in on the left-hand side. So they're traveling along these optical circuits, these optical paths, and the kind of light colored kind of reddish glows, these are all the phase shifters. So we have a complex, optical network here, but we can encode the matrix values that we're trying to multiply those inputs with um, by setting the phase shifters to appropriate values. And at the end, we have some detectors. Now, this particular circuit, which they're proposing, could um, multiply the inputs by any arbitrary matrix by using something called singular value decomposition. So the mathematicians will know 
you can um, represent a matrix as a uh, an initial unitary with a non-unitary diagonal matrix and a, an output unitary as well. And this thing is called singular value decomposition. That's what they proposed in this paper in 2017. Um, so yeah, it can do some very general matrix multiplications using this. Now, this is the technique which um, a lot of companies are using, but what does it look like physically? So how do we actually build these circuits? So this here is a microscope image of just one such um, photonic circuit. So this is built using something called silicon photonics. So in silicon photonics, what we're doing is we're using silicon wave, silicon ribs of silicon, so um, a small channel of silicon, to communicate light in the same way as an optical fiber does. So we're familiar with the fact that you can shine light down an optical fiber and it can go around corners and travel long distances. Well, we can do the same thing by using silicon. Except here, instead of having an optical fiber, what we've got is in a planar structure like an ele electronic chip. So these purple lines on the uh, microscope image are the waveguides. And the light is traveling along these waveguides. Um, and on top of this, we have an electrical layer, which are the gray lines, and these are gold contacts to the electrical layer. So on the right hand side, I've drawn a kind of cross section, a simplified cross section we have. What we have is um, a silicon substrate on the chip, silicon dioxide um, uh, above that. And then we have this rib of silicon with dimensions of about 220 nanometers by typically about 450 or 500 nanometers across. So they're extremely small. And the light, so this red uh, blob, which I've drawn here, is the light traveling along that rib of silicon confined due to the high refractive index of the silicon relative to the materials around it, just like what you get in an optical fiber. And in this particular chip, the phase shifts are imparted by heating up the chip above the waveguides. So there's a thermal optic effect which changes the refractive index of the waveguide depending on how hot the silicon is. So this, um, this gives us an idea how we actually build these devices using exactly the same techniques as used for electronic chips and the same equipment that lets us um, construct incredibly complex and small devices um, using silicon photonics. Now various companies are doing this and commercializing the opportunities so um, that paper I showed you a few slides ago, the one from 2017 um, involving the large photonic network, the two lead authors in that paper have gone off and started um, competing companies commercializing this. One of them is called Lightelligence and the other one is called Light Matter. But they're both taking largely similar approaches. So using these large photonic networks to do matrix vector calculations uh, products. So um, we can see here, we have silicon chip with, um, these are optical fibers coming in to power it. So there's a laser coming in and powering and providing light to travel through these micro optical circuits. Uh, and similarly, in the light matter chip, they have the same thing with a laser coming in off chip onto the um, uh, optical circuit. And they've also, also bonded electronics on there. There's a few differences between the approach that these two companies are taking. Uh, Lightelligence seem to be taking an approach of using off-the-shelf um, silicon modulators, so um, uh, depletion, um, carrier depletion modulators they use for telecommunications. But light matter are taking a different approach of using nano-optical electromechanical systems, which actually are a lot slower, it seems, but have a potential to be much, much lower energy. A third company working in this domain is Optalysis, a company um, just outside Leeds. And they're taking a similar approach but they're combining um, free space optics with um, photonic chips as well. So by using the free space optics too, they're hoping to be able to fit many more optical modes in. So much greater complexity than you would manage in a simple two-dimensional um, structure like what these two companies are doing. So each have got their own approaches, but there's a lot of similarities in there. Now, so far, what I've spoken about is just the, you know, the selling pitch for optical computing. I've given you all the positives, but I've not said anything about the challenges surrounding optical computing. Now, practical optical computing still faces many challenges, particularly around the electronics required uh, surrounding the optics. So everything I've spoken about so far has really been focusing about this optical circuit um, that I've written here. 
I've not really spoken much about the electronics that surrounds it, and there are quite a lot of electronics. So I'll just briefly go through a few of the key challenges. So one of the first ones uh, is the data conversion. So of course, in a digital electronic computer, the data is all stored digitally as a series of ones and zeros. But what we needed was an, uh, an analog signal. So we need to convert our initial digital data into an analog signal and do the opposite at the end. So the conversion from digital to analog is done in this digital to analog converter. And of course, the opposite is done in a EDC, an analog to digital converter at the output. Now, um, particularly the analog to digital converter at the output, the speed of these isn't particularly high. So although the pulses of light can travel incredibly quickly through the optical circuit, the actual data rate we can uh, achieve is somewhat limited by the speed of the analog to digital converters that exist. So if you go on a website like Maxim Integrated and look at their ADCs, they're typically running at hundreds of megahertz and maybe consuming uh, 100 milliwatts, for example. So that's nowhere near as fast as what the rest of the circuit can operate. But we're somewhat limited by these data conversion rates. The second thing that's worth mentioning is the modulators. Now the modulators, um, different people are taking different approaches to actually modulating the light. So basically uh, making it lighter or darker, depending on what number we're trying to encode. But these modulators do tend to be very large. So the existing um, modulators they use in the telecoms industry are actually extremely large. And because of that, they're very capacitive. So they have quite a large capacitance. So using exactly the same arguments as I used to describe the energy consumption of transistors, we can apply those same arguments to modulators and see that they are intrinsically um, lossy as well and consume large amounts of energy. So quite a lot of work has to be done on not only making the modulators fast, but uh, reducing their energy requirement. And then the final thing is this TIAs, transimpedance amplifiers. Now this amplifier at the output, um, we can get some, it's basically, it's a voltage amplifier with a very high gain. And, that, and they tend to work very well, but it's actually the combination of the photodiode and this amplifier can cause some issues. So the photodiode, um, they're extremely fast, but they do have some capacitance as well. Now this amplifier is composed of a high gain voltage amplifier with some negative feedback applied by um, a feedback resistor. In actual fact, the combination of the capacitance of the photodiode and this feedback resistor results in beyond a certain frequency, the feedback starts to become positive and this amplifying circuit becomes unstable. So that actually also limits the bandwidth we can achieve. Um, now, of course, the larger the capacitance of the photodiode, the lower the frequency that occurs at, so limiting bandwidth, or the larger the feedback resistors, the greater the gain we need um, is going to limit the frequency range over which we can operate. So it's really important to have as low loss as possible in this optical circuit, because um, if we try and amplify it too much, the capacitance of the photodiode will induce an instability into our amplifier. So I can talk more about that later if anyone's interested, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Now, something I've not really spoken about in this presentation so far, everything I've done has been about classical computing, but of course, corner computing could be the subject of several talks in itself. Um, you've probably heard of quantum computing. It's got a lot of press coverage recently. And the reason for that is because, you know, the universe is quantum at its most fundamental level. And so the most efficient way to simulate one quantum system is to use another. That's one motivation for trying to extend the computational devices we have into the quantum regime. It's also believed that uh, the parallelism enabled by quantum mechanical superpositions, you may have heard of uh, quantum mechanical superpositions, this should allow us to solve problems that are intractable by classical means. So it's believed that not only is quantum mechanics an efficient way to simulate other quantum systems, but it possibly opens the route towards solving mathematical problems that just aren't practical uh, by any classical means. Okay, and that the basis of that is the parallelism enabled by quantum mechanics. I won't go into it in any more detail than that, but I'll show you an example circuit of what quantum computing currently looks like. So um, optical quantum computing um, 
uses, tends to use, or often uses, single photons rather than great optical pulses. But otherwise, the circuit looks somewhat similar. So we have, again, a laser, we have a photonic chip, and we have detectors at the end. So this is quite similar to what I was showing you in the um, case of classical optical computing. And in actual fact, some people have published papers where they've used chips designed for quantum computing and just done a classical calculation on them instead, um, because they can be interchanged sometimes. So the overall structure of the chip is quite similar. The main difference is that we're using single photons, okay, and, and we use single photons. We're generating these single photons in the source, and we're detecting single photons at the end. This particular experiment was the first time that some there's a pair of um, two pairs of photons generated here. One half of the pair goes off to herald the presence of the other. So what we actually have is a heralded pair of photons go and interfere in the central region and are detected at the output. This is the first experiment that demonstrated heralded interference of two photons on a chip. And it was done by um, my colleagues and I at the University of Bristol in 2018, but it was published in that year. Um, so this is basically a two photon experiment. Since then, um, many other companies are looking at optical quantum computing as well. Some of them using different techniques, some of them using very similar techniques. So um, optical quantum computing is at an earlier stage of development, but there's a lot of companies looking at it. So for example, Xanadu is a company in uh, Canada who are using optical computing, but they're actually using the uh, quantum optical properties of squeezed brighter states of light. So they're not using single photons, they're doing something called continuous variable quantum computing. Uh, we also have companies like Orca Computing based in London, who are basing their uh, computing paradigm on a uh, quantum memory, which um, Joshua Nunn and others developed at the University of Oxford, I believe. So they've spun out of that research. And then there's companies like Quant, who are in the, um, who are a German company, a spin-off of Trumpf, and I'm not quite sure what they're doing. There's not a huge amount of information on their website, but they've said they're getting in the quantum area. And Quix, which is another optical quantum computing company in the Netherlands, who are, as far as I can tell, building passive optical networks. Um, I'm not quite sure what they're planning to do in that in the long run. And probably the most ambitious of all the companies is SciQuantum, which is a direct descendant of um, actually the University of Bristol. So some of the academics from Bristol went off to uh, San Francisco and Palo Alto, and they've founded a company there uh, with several hundred million dollars developing full-scale quantum computers. So out of all of these companies, probably SciQuantum is the one which is the most ambitious. And I thought I'd just pop a um, quote from SciQuantum in the presentation. So whereas I was doing a two-photon experiment, SciQuantum are talking about building devices with a million plus qubits, or a million plus photons at least. And as I quantum say from the website, we've chosen instead to focus on the end goal, a large scale error corrected general purpose quantum computers to have a really incredibly ambitious aim. When you think about it, it's only four or five years ago when we did the first heralded two photon experiment, and these people are talking about doing a million photons already. But they firmly believe that silicon photonics um, this approach of using chip scale optics is the only way to scale things up to that level, which is necessary, okay? So it may seem crazy, but then when you think about it, Shockley invented the semiconductor, uh, the transistor at some point, and there's only one transistor, and it was about the size of, um, it was quite large, okay? <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, fairly large, maybe a box of matches, maybe a bit bigger than that. Um, it maybe would have seemed crazy to have tens of billions of transistors on a silicon electrical chip at that time. So perhaps in the same way, although it maybe seems outlandish to go from two photons on a chip to millions of photons on a chip, you know, we've, we've tackled these problems before by using uh, microelectronics. So what are the challenges of quantum computing? Well, they share many of the same challenges as classical, but with a few extra ones. And again, each of these bullet points could be a talk in itself, but I'll just mention them. So the generation of the single photons on demand in pure states, so a pure quantum mechanical state, and indistinguishable between multiple sources is extremely difficult. Okay, so there's several different techniques for generating single photons, but they all struggle in different 
metrics, either they're not on demand or the states aren't perfectly pure, or you can't get multiple sources to interfere with each other because they are distinguishable, okay? Another problem particular to quantum computing is that the losses can't be compensated for by amplification. Unlike in that, in that previous circuit I showed you where there's, I had amplifiers all over the place, we can't do that not in um, quantum computing. Uh, as soon as you lose a photon, it's just lost, or as soon as a pulse becomes attenuated, you can't amplify it without losing the quantum mechanical nature of it. A third thing is that you can't get any nonlinearities, or the deterministic nonlinearities are extremely difficult to implement. Um, optics tends to be linear. Um, uh, companies like SciQuantum are taking the approach of using probabilistic nonlinearities, which means the circuits have to be even bigger to compensate for that. And a uh, fourth thing is the detection, the single photon detection has to be done at cryogenic temperatures. So the detectors we used in Bristol ran at about two or three Kelvin, um, so minus 270 degrees centigrade. It's, they actually work incredibly well, but the real problem is combining these um, complex photonic circuits with phase shifters, which are probably driven electrically, with the detectors and all the drive electronics in an environment, which is probably only going to be a few tens of Kelvin at best, is extremely challenging. And electronics have to be extremely high speed because the techniques people are using requires feet forward. So you change the optical circuit depending on, um, you change the electrical settings of the optical circuit depending on what measurements you made previously, and it has to be done extremely quickly. So I won't say any more about quantum, quantum computing there. I'll just move on finally to the conclusions. Um, so I think we're coming up to about time at the moment. So there's, the conclusions are basically there's many ambitious plans for both classical and quantum optical computing. Um, obviously the classical ones are further ahead. People are actually making chips and um, look very close to at least starting beta programs or actually even having things that can be sold and, and tested. Quantum computing is a bit further away from that, um, but a lot of the progress made from classical feed into the quantum architectures as well. Whether these are successful or not, and really I'm talking here about the classical devices, whether they're commercially successful really depends on things like the energy efficiency. Can we do this at lower energy than we can use in electronics? Um, if we can't, then it's not really um, appealing for data centers. Can we do it faster than we can using um, digital electronics? That probably looks like one we can do by the look of it. And um, there seems to be indication for some problems it definitely is faster. What's the accuracy? Remember, we're doing analog computing here. So when we encode things in an analog format, there will be um, accuracy issues um, and noise introduced, which we can't really remove and use the same techniques as we use in digital electronics. There's also questions about the manufacturing cost, how complex are these chips gonna be? What about the, the laser source and the detectors? The detector should be fine, but the laser is again, currently, tends to be an uh, off-chip component, which <clears throat> has to be bonded in some way or fed into the chip. And finally, the applications. It might be that optical computing isn't the best solution for all um, computing applications, but maybe people will find applications for you know, the real killer apps for optical computing where the linearity of the circuit isn't an issue. Um, things like Fourier transforms and matrix multiplication, for example. Um, but just the speed or energy efficiency is the key thing. So, um, of course, in quantum computing, um, in some ways in quantum computing, it's, uh, although the technical challenges are much greater, you can't do a direct comparison with electronic computing. Quantum computing is doing something qualitatively different. It's doing things which are just totally unfeasible using current generation computers. So even if they're not particularly energy efficient or fast, um, then they will solve problems which we can't do classically. So the technical challenges are much greater, but it's also a big paradigm shift. So that's one of the big selling points of those. So I'll stop there. We've um, run about a minute over time and I'll stop and ask if anyone's got any questions. So thank you for listening. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, talk, Gary. So on behalf of the audience, I, I, I think uh, I, can, I can thank the speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Anton. Uh, and uh, indeed, now uh, now we have some time uh, for questions.
Uh, I would use my uh, position as uh, uh, the chairman to, to ask the first one. Uh, it's about classical, classical optical computers. Uh, so when comparing quantum and classical computers, people usually speak of quantum supremacy, right? Uh, so in terms of optical supremacy, uh, where are we right now? If it's an industry, then there must be some problems that are better solved with optical computers, right? Yeah, I think people need to think a little about what needs to be thought about is the application area you're looking at, I think. Um, it's, it, like I was saying, it might be the case that if all you're interested in is speed, if you just want your calculation to go as fast as possible, it might be that an optical computer uh, will achieve that. Or it might be the case that if you're looking for energy efficiency, it might be that an well, optical computer might end up being quite slow, but if you can build one that's more energy efficient, then that would be a selling point. Similarly, looking back over the years, um, Hewlett Packard were interested in optical computing uh, quite a few years ago, and they weren't interested in speed or efficiency, they were interested in low latency. So they were trying to route optical packets from optical networks, so you transmit data packets through optical networks, you know, through the internet optically. And they were just interested in routing those packets extremely quickly with low latency. And so that was their motivation to do optical computing. So um, I, I guess I don't necessarily think that optical computing is gonna be electronic computing in all areas. In actual fact, what I'm imagining is you're gonna have some optical coprocessor working alongside all the electronics and that will be useful in certain circumstances. But um, at the moment, at the moment, what all the companies seem to be going for is faster and more energy efficient. They're going for both of those things. That's their selling points. I don't know whether they're actually going to achieve those or not. Um, okay. I don't think it matters if they achieve both. I think if they just achieve one of them, then they'll find the niche and that's okay. Okay, so faster and more energy efficient seems like standard requirements for electronics, uh, electronical computers, yeah. right? And in terms of this, let's say we compare uh, a standard CPU chip of uh, a standard size and energy, uh, energy consumption with a contemporary uh, optical chip. So, so if, you, if you look at, um, I forget when, whether it's light matter or light intelligence, if you go on one of their websites, they have comparisons of a NVIDIA GPU against okay. um, their PACE chip. I think that's light intelligence, I think, mm -hmm. or light matter. I can't remember now. So the PACE chip, anyway. And uh, at least in the tests that they've done, their PACE chip comes out very favorably. Um, so the tests they've done, their chip is faster than the GPU. Um, but what's the energy consumption? Did they include the off-chip laser? I'm not sure. Remember, this is marketing materials coming from yeah, the company. Okay. okay? <laughs> they're not gonna say if the energy consumption was worse at the moment, and they're not mm. gonna show the tests where it came out slower. They're only gonna show the tests where it came out faster. Certainly for the light matter, the circuit they're using, I think has the potential to be um, much lower energy because they're using these nano optical mechanical systems. So you, once once you set the phase shifters in a certain position, the energy consumption is tiny. So for situations where you're just encoding optical data in and feeding it to a static chip, I think that could be quite fast and low energy. If you're having to reconfigure the chip the whole time, the energy consumption is going to go up very quickly. So that's like the performance of that's going to really vary depending on your use case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, a related, uh, a related question from uh, from Fa Fabrice Lassi, uh on. Well, it's actually uh, uh, from a slightly different angle. When do you think we'll get photonic computers at home? So, what's the time scale needed to get from here uh, to having photonic computers home? Probably the thing. I guess there's there's various technical challenges as to whether they're competitive or not. Um, one of the big issues with optical interconnects at the moment is, uh, is laser sources. So um, at the moment, there are not really any working or good low cost, you know, non-research level on-chip lasers. Okay, so 
um, all these optical chips will require a laser to be um, provided as a source. At the moment, these lasers are big things the size of a desktop computer that sit next to this tiny little chip. So they're going to have to probably start getting lasers on the chips themselves. Um, I think probably they'll have to do that for it to become cost effective. Now, people have been developing on chip lasers for quite a few years. And I think the last conference I went to maybe two or three years ago where people were discussing this, no one would give me a time scale for when an on chip laser would be available, but everybody said it would be soon. And not long afterwards, it would be available through commercial foundry services We actually make the chips. So if things go to plan, maybe it'll be, I don't know, five years before you start getting on-chip lasers. And I think once they've got the laser on-chip, once they've got the uh, modulators a bit more energy efficient and the detectors on-chip are excellent at the moment, then it could be, I don't know, five to 10 years before we start getting co-processors, cool maybe, maybe not at home, but maybe in certain, uh, maybe uh, in certain special use cases, you know. I'm sure the company will say two to three, but I think I'd say five, five to 10. <laughs> so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I, I can't see no questions from the online audience uh, in the Q&A the uh, window, uh, nor in the chat itself. So I would like to encourage encourage the audience, uh, especially due to the fact that uh, I've seen uh, other uh, other experts uh, from the field of photonics to uh, to ask some questions, really tricky questions to to the speaker. Uh, in so while we have some time, uh, may I ask a, a probably a slightly technical question from uh, from the introduction? So you used some examples uh, with transistors to compare, uh, well, to, to, to explain the limitations of uh, standard electronics. Uh, I was actually thinking of stealing some of your slides for, uh, for uh, my own lectures. Uh, so do I understand correctly that the examples you've shown uh, are specific to field effect transistors or do they work for so both for bipolar junction transistors and field effect transistors, they're going to have uh, input capacitance. So the, mm -hmm. the models are slightly different. So a, a bipolar junction transistor is current driven, basically, so a current gain, whereas a field effect transistor is voltage driven. So it's got a transconductance, but it's similar. It's very similar. Um, so the same arguments apply basically for FETs. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so if you want to reduce uh, the capacitance, in both cases, you want to reduce the size, basically, of the of the base, or so yeah. you want to make them smaller. But they're kind of reaching the limits of what you can do now. So, that's hence the search for an alternative computing method. Okay, and uh, so uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there, there are several other options, right? So, uh, if speaking about silicon, silicon chips, the first thing you can you well, could imagine is replacing silicon, uh, silicon platform with gallium arsenides to increase mobility, right? Mm -hmm. do, do they have plans for that instead of uh, photonics, or is it? I think I have read. I have read an awful lot about it, but I've seen that mentioned using different material systems. I guess the question is. There's so much investment gone in silicon, there's a huge inertia um, from against changing to anything else. You know, the the massive know-how and investment has gone into producing um, you know, 12 inch wafer fabs for silicon is enormous. Most of the you know alternative material systems tend to be done in, in fabrication facilities which produce much smaller chips and uh, much smaller dyes at a much higher cost and without anywhere near the kind of precision which you, you can do in silicon. Um, so of course, change material systems, a huge change. It's an option, I'm sure. And th this, this is why you are, you are doing uh, silicon photonics. Because it's cheap, think it's, yeah. it's, it's relatively accessible. The great thing about it is silicon photonics, all this equipment which was used in electronics, um, which is now out of date for electronics, 
uh, can be perfectly well used for photonic circuits because they tend to be a lot bigger. And so if you want to go and get a silicon photonic chip made, you can get that for um, a few thousand pounds, a one-off chip, maybe 2,000 pounds or something, uh, which is incredibly low price. Uh, and uh, you can send the design off, they'll do a check, uh, a design rule check, and they'll send it back to you within a few months, which is great. There's no other material system you can do that in at the moment. Uh, there, there is a question from Oliver Snowden. Uh, with the homodyne-based <laughs> homodyne uh, scheme for analog multiplication that you described, are there any published demonstrations where the output is an optical form without needing optical, electrical, optical conversion? So repeat that, that with the homodyne detector, is there versions with the outputs optical? Are there any published demonstrations where output itself is optical, so you don't need optical to electrical conversion. If it's, if it's all optical, then you don't need uh, converts, uh, com uh, yeah. converters. I guess the, so the, the electrical, the important electrical point is the nonlinearity of the detectors where you're detecting the intensity of the field rather than the electric field itself. But of course, um, the optical equivalent of that is something like a kernel linearity and okay you have kernel linearities but they're quite weak so maybe you could make a circuit which had an optical output but the pulse strength would have to be extremely high and um, uh, Oliver's been in the I know Oliver's been in the lab before you'd, you'd be having to feed it with a Prita laser with um, you know Prita lasers the one I was using was about 200 watt peak power or something and you can get a nice strong nonlinearity in a silicon chip then but um, the energy consumption would be enormous. But I'm sure theoretically it's possible. And I think having uh, optical nonlinearities would open up a whole range of possibilities um, in addition to just doing that home and down detector fully optically, um, aside from quantum stuff, which you know, we've spoken about a lot. Um, for example, in the neural networks, the nonlinear function at the end, they have between the different layers of a neural network. It'd be nice if that was done optically. At the moment, the current implementation is you have optical inputs, you do the optical matrix multiplication, then you, like Oliver was saying, you do the homodyne detection, convert everything into an electrical signal, and then also do the ReLU function, um, the, the nonlinear uh, kind of synapse function between the layers. You do that electrically too, and then go back into optics again. It's very inefficient. So it'd be great if this whole thing could be done in one chain optically. Um, uh, another question from Kevin Sinclair. My guess is someone someone else who is known to you. He uh, may be a mole. Who, 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 who thanks you for, for your talk and uh, asked the following question. You mentioned that transistors have become about as small as possible. Could these optical developments result in smaller chips and therefore more powerful computing in smaller devices. What about this, the characteristic sizes? So the, the, the optical chips are actually a lot bigger than the electric ones. Um, so when you think about the transistors in an electronic chip are tens of nanometers, whereas the optical components, the width of this waveguide through which the light is traveling is about, um, let me think, Uh, 40,000 times bigger. <laughs> so it's quite big, actually. They're, they're um, yeah, about, uh, oh no, sorry, not that big. They're about 400 nanometers uh, across. Yeah, I'm getting the dimension of 500 nanometers. So the, the transistors are 10 nanometers, the waveguides are 500 nanometers across. They're a lot bigger. Um, on the other hand, when you're multiplying, for example, when you're multiplying numbers together electronically, you need a large number of electrical components. Um, so if you're multiplying a, an n-digit number, if I remember correctly, uh, then you need n squared, two n-digit uh, numbers, you need, I think, n squared full adder circuits, which, so the whole thing becomes quite big. Although the individual components are small, the complexity is quite large, whereas the optical device is at least um, optically simple, even though the individual components are much larger. So um, 
it's hard, kind of hard to tell which one's going to end up being smaller. Uh, at a first glance, it seems like they're going to be roughly the same size. Um, there's not a clear advantage between one and the other. Mm -hmm. Another question from uh, from Sven Hofling. Uh, it's uh, it, it's great to have him in the audience, who also thanks you uh, for for your talk uh, and asks. Uh, you pointed out that optical circuits are generally linear, and nonlinearity is difficult to obtain. In quantum optics, uh, you are able to introduce nonlinearities, while it is difficult. Uh, in quantum optics, yeah, while it is difficult to obtain, uh, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this answer correct. Uh, I'm getting the question. My question, however, is where one needs, uh, in a concrete way, nonlinearity in quantum circuits if 1D photonic cluster states are available for scalable circuits? I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure I understood. I mean, a little good question. Okay, so maybe maybe I misread it at some point, and it would be it, uh, it would be great, of course, to have uh, Sven uh, okay. uh, speak for himself. Uh, okay, so the in in general, let me try to reformulate it. So oh, where non -lin non yeah, okay. I think and if where non linearity is needed in quantum circuits, yeah, one yeah. Dimensional photonic clusters are available in scalable circuits. So cluster states. So, so if you're doing um, if you're doing measurement based quantum computing, like the guys in Psi Quantum are doing, then um, they start off with their basic resource is um, is a cluster state. I guess the question is how do you generate the cluster state? So the photons are definitely generated by a nonlinear process, and the entanglement between the individual photons are going to be at least in Psi Quantum, as I understand it, they were going to use non-deterministic nonlinearities to create the initial cluster states. Um, I'm not an expert in the architecture of these things, um, but at some point the nonlinearity has to creep in, probably before the cluster states are, are created. And then the measurement-based quantum computing with feed forward happens from that point onwards. That's my basic understanding of the uh, quantum computing architecture, but um, I was more of a hardware person. It's interesting that uh, in, in silicon, I'm, I'm not sure how it works in silicon photonics. So in uh, in exciton polariton community, uh, nonlinearity, well, Kerr nonlinearity uh, strands may be as uh, as high as possible, practically, right? And it appears that you don't need it to be very very light, large, right? Because uh, because exciton polaritons are not used uh, so far that much in, in, in quantum optical computers, at least. Is that correct? Yeah, so the nonlinearities don't have to be very large. I think, well, it depends. If you go back to the original papers about doing C0 gates with uh, nonlinearities, they had to be very large, um, mm -hmm. like deterministic nonlinearities. And then, um, you know, this is what. Uh, Jeff Shapiro uh, and Bill Monroe were talking about uh, whether that was possible or not. But then people use, as far as I'm from the quantum computing that I've seen done in Bristol, it's all non-deterministic non nonlinearities, so uh, heralded uh, nonlinearities. In which case you don't need any. It's a, it's a linear circuit, you know. Mm -hmm. but the, the, price you're paying for that is that it's, it's not deterministic anymore, so. Finally, uh, finally another question. Uh, so regarding this, uh, which, uh, which computer, uh, where is it, uh, where is it uh, now again? <laughs> so it's currently, is asking. yeah, it's currently at the National Museum of Computing in Bletchley Park. So it was in Wolverhampton, until the 1970s it was being used and then it was transferred to the Birmingham Museum and it was kept in stores until about 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. um, and then the National Museum of Computing approached the Birmingham Museum and asked if they could take it down to, to Bletchley Park and restore it. At that stage quite a few of the people that built the computer and operated it were still alive so the initial team from Harwell and so they got the team in from Harwell, asked them a few questions, 
and went through it all and restored it. So it's currently working. Um, I don't know if it's working today, uh, but you can certainly go down there and probably see it in operation on special, special days. Um, like I said, it's the, it's the world record holder for the oldest uh, working uh, or oldest existing digital storage computer, storage program computer. So another, another selling point why Wolverhampton is an interesting place. <laughs> In actual fact, I think I've seen one of the punched card uh, machines uh, for that computer lying in someone's office in Wolverhampton. Oh. So uh, I think, uh, I, I might be wrong, but it looked like a, some kind of punched card device that somebody in the admin office has had outside there on their desk. So I might go and ask them about it one day. <laughs> As a souvenir. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Uh -huh. So one, one more question just popped up. Uh, what are the advantages for using light-based computing in classical computing and what are the, okay, so what are the major advantages of quantum computing versus classical? I guess it's a topic for another lecture. Uh, yes. Some of it was actually partially answered, right? Uh, yeah, I'd say in summary, um, the advantages, is this advantages using light versus something else? Both. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I guess for the light-based computing, we might be running out of road in terms of electronic computing. It might be the case that the opportunity to scale electronic computers to improve are running out of road. So we need to look at something else. Optical methods, uh, for the reasons I was saying, noise, power consumption, speed might help. And in terms of the quantum computing, um, well, in general, quantum computing is believed to be able to solve problems which are intractable classically. Yeah. All right. So with this, uh, I I think uh, I I think we don't have uh, any more questions. And uh, the very last, uh, com well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the speaker again. Thank you, Anton. Uh, and finally, wrap up this uh, this session by. Uh, advertising the next uh, lecture from the series, uh, which will be given by Dr. Nina Voronova uh, from uh, Moscow, uh, sorry, from Moscow Engineering Physics Institute uh, in Russia uh, on, uh, on 17th of February, so in a month. And, uh,